purpose of this workshop is for us to provide you all with current information, uh, ways that we can support and advocate for undocumented immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers, which is in line with the resolution. We have uh, three wonderful speakers today that will provide you with that information. We also have documentary information that you can have, uh, some of which has been provided to you already, some of which the workshop. Uh, this is our timeline for this evening. Uh, I'm Sandra Castillo. I'm uh, serving currently as the chair of the task force. I serve as the assisting priest at Santa Teresa de Avila in Chicago. And um, with us today is uh, Reverend Primo Racimo, who is the vicar of St. Margaret of Scotland uh, Church in Chicago, who will give the opening prayer. Uh, Fred Sal, who is the senior policy counsel at Illinois Coalition for Immigrant and Refugee Rights. And Fred will discuss the current pending federal immigration legislation in Congress, its status, the status of immigration detention centers and deportations, and how we can engage in advocacy. Uh, Shauna Willis uh, is the executive director and founder of the Refugee Education and Adventure Challenge. And Shauna will discuss the current Afghan refugee crisis, the history of the refugee uh, resettlement program, and ways in which churches and congregations can be more involved in hosting and assisting refugees and asylum seekers. Uh, Sister Bernadine Cargi is a member of the Dominican Sisters of Sinsawana, Wisconsin. She is a member of the American uh, Immigration Lawyers Association and Sister Bernadine has been very active in as an immigration lawyer and in advocacy for immigrants and for Im just uh, immigration policies for many decades. Uh, Father Primo and I then will uh, be the uh, people for hosting your uh, uh, posting your uh, questions and uh, for our panelists to answers. And, uh, and then uh, Father Primo will close us down with the closing prayer. Uh, we, think so. we are giving thanks to Reverend Miguel Briones, who is a, a deacon at uh, St. Mark's in Glen Allen. He is going to be providing a Spanish language interpretation throughout the uh, evening. And we also thank um, uh, our diocesan staff people who are with mm -hmm. us here today, uh, with uh, Luis and Luisa and with uh, Crystal for providing us with the technology to make this event possible. Uh, and so I will turn it over now to Father Primo. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Let us pray. Lord God, help us to remember those who tonight will go to sleep unfed and unwelcome. The strangers in foreign lands, people who have fled for their lives and are far from their homes. We lift up to you those who are escaping persecution and conflict, having fled death, torture, or ruthless exploitation. So many carry wounds, mental and physical. So many have suffered greatly. Lord Jesus, give us more of your compassion for their flight. Soften our hearts to their situation and help us follow your lead in seeking justice and mercy on their behalf. We pray for an end to the wars, poverty and human rights abuses that drive desperate people to become refugees in the first place. We give thanks for people working in troubled countries like the United States and ask for more of your blessing so we can bring life, dignity, and hope to those that remain. We thank you that you are Lord of all the earth and all its people are loved by you. We pray these things in the name of your son who was himself born into the troubled life of a refugee. This we ask in your name. Amen. And we now turn the platform over to our friend, Fred Sao. Okay. 
Thank you. And uh, let me just make sure that I can do this. Um, you're with me here. Okay. Um, I have a, you know, I have a number of slides uh, that I'm going to present. Um, so, um, and let me actually, let me actually present this thing. Um, sorry, I, let me, there we go. Okay, <clears throat> so um, my task over the next uh, 15 minutes or so is uh, to review uh, some legislative updates uh, on the federal level and then also on the state level. Um, the situation on the federal level is quite fluid right now. So uh, information that I present tonight might not actually be be operative a week from tonight. Um, so, you know, um, yeah, but I'll provide information on how to get updates and action alerts um, a little bit later on. So, um, first off, um, you know, uh, you know, I want to discuss what's happening at the federal level. And uh, uh, as context, um, you know, I think we all realize that the Democrats, <coughs> excuse me, Democrats control the what <coughs> the White House and uh, both ha both houses of Congress. Uh, though the control, <coughs> excuse me, I just finished eating dinner, so bear with me, please. Um, uh, so uh, Democrat, Democratic control of the House is very narrow and uh, Democratic control of the Senate is razor thin. Um, they essentially need Vice President Harris to break a tie. Um, so in this context, um, you know, it's, quite difficult to pass legislation, especially given the fact that uh, in the Senate, um, due to the filibuster rule, um, a, you know, the, the minority party uh, can essentially block legislation by forcing a supermajority of 60 votes to, uh, to be able to proceed with, uh, with consideration. So um, that unfortunately has thwarted a lot of really good legislation, including legislation on immigration. Dem the Democrats are trying to get around that by um, using a device called budget reconciliation. Um, and budget reconciliation does not require you know, a 60 vote supermajority in order to proceed. Instead, it requires a simple majority, uh, which in this case would be 51 votes. Uh, but again, keep in mind, this requires all 50 Democrats plus Vice President Harris to break a tie. Now, um, <clears throat> in order, you know, as the name suggests, budget reconciliation is primarily used for um, uh, proposals that have some impact on the federal budget and federal spending and federal revenue. So um, in, in order to be included in budget reconciliation, um, these, you know, the Senate parliamentarian um, basically reviews the pieces of pieces within the legislation to um, ensure that um, yes, this this in fact does have some impact on the budget, and that um, the that impact on the budget isn't just a matter of policy. It's it's really more a matter of actual you know you know actual spending. Um, <clears throat> so with that, um, you know. Senate Democrats in particular have have begun with a couple of proposals um, that uh, you know you know to regarding immigration to include in budget reconciliation. There was a plan A, which had to do with um, three major populations. Um, first off, immigrants who came as children who would be eligible for the Dream Act. Um, also, immigrants from certain countries that. Um, Either, either currently are or have been uh, covered by temporary protected status. This basically is, you know, would include a, about a dozen countries where there was, where there was civil war or civil strife or natural disasters like hurricanes or, or earthquakes. Um, you know, and then the third population is essential workers, uh, the, basically the people who kept working through, through the through the current and ongoing COVID pandemic uh, to basically keep our economy afloat. 
Um, unfortunately, the Senate parliamentarian did not like that plan, uh, did not believe that uh, the budget impact of that plan was, uh, was, you know, was, uh, you know, it was a, a true matter of budget budget policy as opposed to something that's more um, more you know more of a <clears throat> excuse me more of an immigration policy consideration. Um, Senate the Senate Democrats came back with a second proposal, Plan B, which has to do with registry. Um, this is a part of the immigration laws that basically allows. <clears throat> Anybody who came to the United States before a certain cutoff date uh, to uh, apply for a green card. Uh, it's basically a statute of limitations on, on um, you know, on unauthorized stay in the United States. Uh, the current date, uh, the current cutoff date and registry is 1972. Uh, so the idea was to update the registry date to 2010 and thereby allow anybody who came to the United States uh, up through 2009 uh, to apply for a green card. Um, the Senate parliamentarian, unfortunately, didn't, didn't particularly like that idea either. Uh, so now um, Cong Congress is currently considering a third proposal, which is called parole. And I'm going to describe what parole is, is in a bit more detail. So um, this graphic here just Shows shows a summary of the state of play. Um, so Plan A was uh, shot down by the Senate, by, excuse me, Senate parliamentarian. Plan B was also at least informally rejected by the parliamentarian, and now uh, Congress is moving on to Plan C. Okay, so what is parole? Uh, parole is something that already exists in immigration law. It's a temporary protection. Um, and uh, I guess as you know, as Sean as will discuss, uh, you know, this parole has been in the news quite quite recently in the context of the Afghan evacuees, uh, many of whom are being um, you know are are being brought to the United States under humanitarian parole. Uh, parole, it's by itself, does not grant you know a pathway to citizenship or permanent legal status unlike the other two proposals, plan A and plan B. Parole only, you know, merely allows someone to live in the United States, you know, temporarily, but protected, you know, un under government protection. Now, I, I should say here that um, <clears throat> parole will allow a certain range of people who have close relatives or who are U.S. citizens or employers who are willing to sponsor them uh, to uh, apply for green cards in the United States. Everybody else, though, who would you know who does not have such a sponsor but who would be getting parole does would not have an avenue to you know to <clears throat> to get lawful status, uh, permanent lawful status, or citizenship. Okay, so. The current uh, proposal, what's uh, what's on the table now in Congress, is a pro proposal that would allow anybody who came to the United States on or before January 1st, 2011, to apply for parole. Uh, this would cover about 7 million people throughout the country, including a approximately 344,000 um, here, in, here in the state of Illinois. Now, um, there are, <clears throat> now, just because someone makes that cutoff date doesn't necessarily mean that they'll get parole. There are certain bars that are going to still apply, including um, bars involving criminal convictions, national security, and certain other, certain other considerations. Um, so the actual numbers who may actually qualify are significantly less than the numbers that, that you see on the slide here. Um, the proposal is to enable people to get parole for five years. Um, this would this would uh, basically protect these people from deportation for five years and then extend certain other benefits for five years. Now, um, at the end of five years uh, under this proposal, um, people with parole can renew their parole. But because this is budget reconciliation, which you know, which requires that anything that's provided in reconciliation has to run out in 10 years. So with this parole program. So uh, come September 30th, 2031, um, 
everybody everybody who has parole turns into a pumpkin. Um, that you know, um, unless Congress and uh, and the White House take additional action to protect these individuals. Okay, so um, what do people get with parole? Well, probably most significantly, work permits. Um, so uh, you know, folks would be able to apply for employment authorization. With employment authorization, they can get social security numbers. And with a social security number here in Illinois, you can get a regular driver's license as opposed to um, the temporary visitor driver's license that a lot of undocumented people um, here, here in Illinois are able to get. Um, with parole, you can also get um, permission to travel outside the United States and return. Um, you know, this is this is called advanced parole. Um, now, if someone with parole travels outside the United States um, without getting the the advanced permission or advanced parole, they essentially self deport. So, um, you know, so it's important to get that travel document first before leaving the country. Um, I should note here that uh, unlike uh, a green card where you can work and travel um, just because you have the green card, all you know all of these applications for work permits and travel permissions involve separate applications that cost money. Um, so work permit currently costs four hundred and ninety five dollars. An advanced parole application costs five hundred and seventy five dollars. Both of these applications, uh, both of these forms. Um, unfortunately, involve months long months long waits uh, and backlogs. So um, it may take some time for someone who's applying for a work permit or 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 a travel document to actually get it. Okay, um, I noted here that uh, that uh, there are certain other benefits that that would um, you know you know for which people with parole would be eligible. Um, so um, most immediately, folks with parole would be able to apply for student fe federal student financial aid. Uh, they would also be able to enroll in Obamacare, um, unlike unlike people unlike undocumented people um, who are currently excluded expressly from Obamacare. Also, um, you know, like people with green cards, um, people with parole would be eligible for many, many other forms of public, public benefits, including Medicaid, SNAP, and, and TANF, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. So, so um, folks would not be immediately eligible for those benefits, but if they, you know, if they get the parole and then uh, renew their parole dur during, their, during their second period of parole, they would be eligible to receive these benefits. A um, couple of other things to note here. Um, so under, as this proposal is currently written, parole can only be revoked uh, by Homeland Security if they determine that the person should not have qualified for parole to begin with. So it's not as though a new administration can take over the White House and take over Homeland Security and then just, re and then just revoke people's parole willy-nilly. That said, though, because this is a legal creation, um, what uh, Congress and the White House can give, they can also take away. Um, so, and and potentially they could use the same process of budget reconciliation um, to um, you know to to take away this uh, this parole program altogether. Okay, a um, couple of other notes here. Um, uh, you know. You know, again, you know, everybody turns into a pumpkin as of September 30th, 2031, if not before. Um, the, the law doesn't say anything about what happens when parole ends. Um, and again, you know, uh, Congress and the White House would need to take some action to extend further protections uh, or ideally grant green cards to folks. Uh, it also does not really say a whole lot about what happens if you know, or how how the information that uh, people provide to Homeland Security in their applications gets used, other than that Homeland Security um, cannot refer somebody to ICE solely based on the on that on that application information. Um, now, 
that that's not to say though that uh, they can't refer people to ICE based on additional information and using using the information in the application along with some you know some some other some other data that they they're able to identify. So this is a real weak spot in this proposal. Okay, um, let me let me say here um, that. Um, you know, even though parole is currently included in the bill that's now before Congress, um, it's uh, there is some movement afoot to try to reinsert Plan B, the registry proposal, and um, because the parliamentarian has already indicated her disapproval of that of that proposal, um, this would necessarily involve the Senate disregarding the advice of the parliamentarian, um, which uh, may also be another tricky, a tricky remove maneuver. Um, so um, ICRR has taken the position that we want a path to citizenship. We do not, we do not want parole in place of this path to citizenship. So, um, so we are, you know, pushing our members of Congress, uh, our, our senators, you know, Senator Durbin, Senator Duckworth, um, Congressman Garcia, um, you know, um, you know, to, uh, you know, to push as hard as they can for a pathway to citizenship, even if it means disregarding a parliamentarian, and, you know, even if it means a much narrower margin of passing this legislation um, in either chamber, in e either the House or the Senate. Right now, where it stand, where this stands, is that the, you know, this is part of the Build Back Better bill. Build Back Better is currently pending on the House floor. Um, the the House this past Friday evening approved the uh, the rule which sets forth the procedures for consideration of this bill. Um, and you know, the, the current the, the the vote is currently planned for next week. Um, that said, there might still be time um, to um, get, get this bill further amended, um, particularly if, uh, there are other, if there are other issues that come up that people want to change. Um, so you know, we're going to be tr trying to push as much as we can to get this fixed on the House side. If, it, if this passes the House in its current form, uh, we're going to try to push on the Senate side and uh, you know, nudge Senator Durbin along to um, you know, still hold out for a path pathway to citizenship for the registry program. And uh, if that involves disregarding the parliamentarian tarian, doing, doing that as well. Okay, so um, that's the federal level. Um, let me say a few words about, uh, about some major legislation that we passed on the state level. Um, so um, this is, um, you know, what I'm going to talk about is the Illinois, Illinois Way Forward Act that I think some of you are somewhat already familiar with. Um, this is legislation that passed the General Assembly back in May and that Governor Pritzker signed in August. Um, and it sets, you know, it, it, it's, it actually builds on some previous legislation, including the Trust Act and, uh, and other, other legislation you know, to further restrict um, uh, local police uh, interactions with immigration and customs enforcement and immigration enforcement generally. So, um, so here um, with Illinois Way Forward, uh, we have restrictions on joint operations, uh, on ICE access to police facilities and equipment, as well as to people in police custody. Uh, it bars direct transfers of, you know, from jails and prisons to over to ICE. It restricts sharing of information. Um, and, you know, again, one major exception to all of this is if ICE is somehow able to produce a criminal warrant that they're looking for somebody, then, you know, those, you know, you know, Local police will need to, um, will, you know, will need to uh, comply with those warrants. ICE, as a as a matter of practice, generally does not seek out criminal warrants. Um, you know, um, you know, unless there's some further some further charge beyond just an immigration violation. Um, this also, uh, you know, this legislation also restricts uh, police inquiries into citizenship and immigration status. 
um, on the theory that uh, what the police do not know and do not have, they cannot in turn share with others, including ICE. Um, and this also uh, empowers the Illinois Attorney General to uh, check up on, you know, check up on violations. You know, if there's a police department that's uh, that's you know actively flouting this law and uh, and you know cooperating with ICE, um, you know, the the Illinois Attorney General can investigate and take action uh, to stop that practice. Probably the parts that part of Illinois Way Forward, though, that's get, been getting the most attention has to do with immigration attention. So um, here in Illinois, uh, there had been three jails that um, had contracts with ICE to, um, you know, to um, to house uh, individuals uh, for immigration detention purposes. Um, so what this what this law does is first off it bars any new jail contracts with ICE, and then second it required those jails that had contracts to begin phasing them out as of January first of next year to essentially exercise their termination clauses on those contracts. So. Um, this combined with legislation that we won two years ago to bar private prisons um, uh, from Illinois, uh, essentially would end immigration attention throughout the entire state. Now, um, I mentioned that there were three, there had been three jails. Um, one of those jails in, far, in, in the far southern part of the state, Pulaski County, has already decided they've had enough. They're getting out of the ICE detention business. Uh, so they ended their contract Labor Day weekend. The other two, the other two county jails, uh, McHenry and Kankakee, are uh, putting up a fight. They've actually filed a federal lawsuit um, challenging the um, challenging these, these provisions of Illinois Forward and trying to um, trying to hang on to their contract with ICE. Um, so uh, you know they they have uh, yeah. Uh, you know, the, currently um, the the counties and the Illinois Attorney General have been exchanging various motions and briefs, um, and um, you know the, the judge that who's hearing this case, who's a who's a judge out in Rockford, um, may be issuing you know may maybe consider you know is currently considering those motions and those briefs and. Uh, you know, we may very well get some kind of decision from that judge um, sometime fairly soon. Um, but at this point, I'm going to exercise my role as timekeeper. Um, okay, I'm so, actually done. Uh, <laughs> okay. um, you can tell everybody that there's a tremendous amount of uh, work going on at the state level. And uh, I would suggest that if you have any questions, Enter your questions in the chat room, and between Father Primo and myself, we'll be uh, uh, presenting those questions to uh, to Fred. Um, and for now, at this point, I will now pass it along to Shauna Willis. Thank you, Fred. Thanks, Fred. Um, I'm going to do the same as Fred. Try to share my screen. Make sure that you can see. <clears throat> Okay, can everybody see this? All right. Um, so I'm, I'm speaking to you about um, the refugee circumstances, including the Afghan crisis. Um, but I, I wanted to start this by leading with a quote that was um, uh, written by the Center for American Progress during a report that they did at the end of 2020, prior to the elections. Um, there were about five or six reports by various institutions um, that were examining, apparently during COVID, people had downtime, they examined the US refugee admissions program. And it was, uh, they were each critiques of how the program could do better. In this particular case, the Center for American Progress reported that one of the challenges of the current refugee resettlement system is that it is centralized and it has become increasingly professionalized over the years with less community involvement. And I think this is a really relevant quote, even though it was prior to the elections, prior to the Afghan crisis, prior to the Biden administration stepping in. Um, it shows that there was a system that was already beginning to crack um, many years prior to even um, the Trump administration's attempt at totally dismantling it. Um, and I'll get back to this in a second. 
but I want you to keep an eye on that community involvement because I think that's why we're all here today. Um, <clears throat> but we're also here to talk about the Afghan uh, crisis. Um, I'm sure everybody has heard at least uh, piecemeal information about what's been going on in Afghanistan and how the US has responded. Um, in our case, we have uh, agreed to um, receive hundreds of thousands of Afghan evacuees. And as of, to, as of now, we've received about 125,000 um, that were evacuated uh, at the end of August. However, there are more than 235 to 245,000 Afghans who are still waiting in Afghanistan who believe that they should have um, refugee status and be able to resettle into the United States. So that's a big question mark for a lot of us in terms of what's gonna to happen to those individuals. And I'll explain that a little bit further in a few minutes. Um, but with the um, Operation Allies Welcome, uh, the Biden administration actually directed the Department of Homeland Security to lead and coordinate this where we, re we received 125,000 individuals who had um, some experience with working and or assisting the US government and uh, non-governmental organizations uh, during our time there over the past two decades. And the majority of those evacuees were actually brought to um, bases, military bases in the Middle East and in <clears throat> Europe, and they were undergoing processing uh, initially. And over the past two months, we've started receiving um, multiple uh, evacuees at eight different military camps across the country. Um, we had three in Virginia, one in Texas, one up here in Wisconsin, another one in Indiana, and one in New Mexico and New Jersey. And the evacuees are uh, a, a, a huge number of individuals um, who have been given different names depending on the status and the rights that they will be granted. Um, so before I get into more detail, I, I love that um, Fred was able to discuss a little bit about what makes a parolee. What I'd like to do is just take you through um, these definitions that we use for humans, human beings. Um, the United States government is really good at giving definitions to people who are all uh, legitimately um, what we would consider refugees. But in this case with the Afghans, um, I want you to understand what the difference is between these different names that we've been hearing over and over again in the news, especially. Um, refugees are persons who have left their country due to a well-founded fear of per persecution. And then we go on to say for reasons of race, religion, nationality, social group, or political opinion. <clears throat> in most cases, refugees have to register with the United Nations outside of the borders of their own country to become refugees. However, you've probably heard, and if you haven't, I'm, I'm giving it to you now, um, that there are different types of refugees. And so um, people like to throw out around P1, P2, P3, when when they're talking about um, US resettlement of refugees. And P2 and P3 are some of the things that people are saying when they refer to Afghan um, evacuees. P2 um, refugees are individuals who are actually uh, identified by the US government, and we decide that we are going to bring specific groups of people based on some sort of assor association with, with us or with the work that we've been doing on the ground across the globe. Um, we decide that they will come as special interest groups, and they do not have to have that pre-authorized United Nations status. Um, the US government will determine that they are refugees, and they can come under this P2 status. P3s are people who actually have relatives who they are trying to, who are, who are already in the United States and they're, they're trying to bring relatives, uh, close relatives, mothers, fathers, sons, daughters into the US. And those individuals are con considered family reunification cases and they're considered P3 as well. Um, so that's the refugee uh, definition in a nutshell. We've also been hearing about special immigrant visas, or a lot of people just call them SIVs. These are individuals, these are human beings, they are SIV holders. And they're people who have worked with the US government, either in non-governmental and or governmental organizations, um, assisting with the war effort in Afghanistan. They may have been translators, interpreters, um, they may have been professionally employed, et cetera. 
Um, prior to the Afghans, we had the Iraqi SIVs. Um, so a lot of people might hear still about the SIVs from Iraq. Um, SIV holders receive the same benefits and the exact same services as do refugees under the US Refugee Admissions Program. And there are some other little caveats to being an SIV holder that I'll get into a little bit later. But I just wanna give you that nutshell. What's the SIV? That's who an SIV is when we're talking about these Afghan SIVs. There are also the humanitarian parolees, which uh, Fred alluded to. Um, in terms of the Afghan parolees, these are again, individuals who have some sort of urgent humanitarian reason for, for entering the United States. In most cases, these are individuals who have assisted the US government on the ground in Afghanistan. In almost all cases, these are people who are fleeing for fear of persecution. Um, but they're only authorized to uh, stay in the, in, in the United States at, under parole for up to two years. Um, so the normal maximum period for parolees is usually one year. The US government made a, a, a dramatic shift for the Afghan parolees and said that they could stay for two years. I'll explain a little bit more about their status and the benefits and what we're trying to do to help these humanitarian parolees in a few seconds. Um, but I also wanna to refer to asylum seekers. And I know that Sister Bernadine is gonna be um, talking a lot more about asylum seekers, but just to make matters uh, clear, asylum seekers are persons who are also seeking refuge in another country due to well-founded fear of persecution, but they don't yet have refugee status legal, rec legally recognized. In addition, they have to ask for protection directly from within the country or border of the country where they hope to remain. So you cannot get asylum, asylum seekers cannot get status until they're actually out, outside the border or within the country that's in this case, the United States. Um, a lot of humanitarian parolees, once their parole is up, will be forced to enter the whole process of seeking asylum. So they will automatically become asylum seekers if we don't make some dramatic changes between now and then. So hopefully that's a little bit more clear. Um, as I said, there are about 265,000 Afghans who are still in Afghanistan who are known to have assisted the, the US government or non-governmental organizations in war efforts over the past two decades. Um, right now, we know that 124,000 of those were evacuated and we have about 55,000 who are parolees being held on those eight military bases. Um, I bring this up, these, these other 265,000 because the SIV process has been taking place in Afghanistan for almost a decade, and there are num a, num a number of individuals, more than 20,000, who actually have already applied for status, who actually believe that they were coming to the United States, and who actually have family members who are eligible to come as well if granted that, that status. Um, so we're talking about 20,000 SIV applicants in Afghanistan right now with about 70,000 children and family members that would also be eligible under that status. And then there are another 50,000 individuals who also worked, who are also considered having worked for the US government who did not get a chance to apply for SIV app status. And so those are all individuals that we are hearing about that are still there and that are still suffering and that still may or may not come to the United States over the next couple of years. But taking us back to what's here, who's here in the US, um, like I said, we've got 55,000 individuals who are being held on those military bases. They're not gonna be able to leave those military bases until they've gone through full refugee processing screening. Um, that's like diligent uh, um, biodata, um, Department of Homeland Security screenings, et cetera, et cetera, lots of medical screenings. Um, it's just a huge series of multiple screenings to assess whether or not they can even be freed to, to, to come into the United States territory. Um, so far within the past couple of weeks, about 9,000 people have actually walked off those military bases. Um, about 4,000 of them were resettled um, either as refugees or as SIVs. And in Illinois, 
in federal fiscal year 2022, which is what we're in right now, and it starts October 1st, we are expecting about 1,500 Afghans will be resettled in Illinois. This is including SIVs, it's including those P2 and P3 refugees, and it's also including parolees who we assume are going to be changing their status um, to SIVs uh, before they actually um, come as uh, as uh, to be resettled. So the parolees that are in custody right now in those military bases are in the process also of applying or have already applied for SIV status, okay? So we've got a 1,500 that are expected. Now, I know I already told you what an asylum seeker is, what a parolee is, et cetera, but I wanted to take you through what the benefits and the status um, points are for those three different individuals. They're all the same people. They are all the same people. They are all refugees. However, the government is, is determining that certain individuals fit certain criteria and therefore the status and benefits are associated with that criteria. The, those who are refugees, those Afghans who are admitted as refugees under the US Refugee Admissions Program will receive what we call resettlement and placement assistance for the first 30 to 90 days, which is basically one lump sum of money per capita. Um, they're also re received eight months of Office of Refugee Resettlement funded medical and cash assistance. And they're also eligible to apply for federal mainstream benefits like SSI, TANF, Medicaid, SNAP. And then after one year in the country, a refugee can apply for legal permanent residence. So that's that pathway that we're all talking about, um, that, that um, Fred was talking about that he wishes we could get for all, all immigrants. Um, refugees, refugees are allowed to apply for that within one year. And they're also immediately authorized for employment. So those are the refugees that have already been approved. They've already come under the US Resettlement Admissions Program. Then there are the SIV holders. And currently those admitted with SIVs are actually um, granted immediate LPR status. They don't have to wait that year. They are given legal permanent resident status as soon as they are granted that SIV status, which is a big difference from what refugees experience. Um, they're also eligible for all those Office of Refugee Resettlement funded medical and cash assistance programs um, for up to eight months. And they also are eligible for the mainstream federal, uh, federal benefits in their state. <clears throat> um, the US government recently, a couple weeks ago, passed um, a $6.3 billion um, aid package that will assist a lot of these Afghan uh, evacuees. And in those cases, and because of that, um, some of these SIV holders will also be eligible or are eligible for resettlement and placement uh, services, which is that per capita grant. Um, and of course, they're all immediately authorized for employment. So those are the two refugees, SIVs, automatically, you know, at least within a year, they have legal permanent residence, they're eligible for all the benefits, federal, local, et cetera, um, and they're also authorized for employment. And then the parolees, um, they're, they're those who have been granted parolee status between July 31st, 2021 and September 30th, 2022 are eligible to apply for work authorization. They're also eligible to apply for those federal mainstream benefits, Office of Refugee Resettlement funded benefits, and also a new Afghan emplacement assistance benefit, um, which is basically the resettlement, uh, the, re the, the re uh, placement, oh my gosh, why am I forgetting what's, re resettlement emplacement, whatever, reception emplacement services. Um, and that they have that until March 31st, 2023, or the end of their parole. The big difference with these, these humanitarian parolees is that they only have temporary status here for two years. After that, as I said, they must apply for asylum or SIV status in order to stay here. <clears throat> so right now, in terms of advocacy, um, what the refugee uh, advocacy community is actually um, the question that people um, do is contact Congress to help us to get the Afghan Adjustment Act passed. The Afghan Adjustment Act um, actually allows Afghan uh, neighbors to apply for legal permanent resident status after one year, similar to refugees. Um, it's recommended 
that this adjustment legislation would cover at-risk uh, Afghans who are paroled in the US between 2021 and 2025. Um, another reason that we're advocating for this to pass, not only for that, these, these evacuees who are under parolee status to be able to apply for LPR status, um, they'd also be eligible for all those refugee benefits. But then also we're really concerned about the number of applications that would have to be processed, reviewed, et cetera, um, if we were to continue with this parolee um, status for these Afghan evacuees. Um, right now there is a backlog affirmative asylum backlog in the US of more than 400,000 cases. And there's a broader immigration backlog of 1.4 million cases. Could you imagine adding the Afghan evacuees to this? It's just going to increase the backlog and the, the ability for these individuals to receive benefits and become legal permanent residents will be diminished significantly. Um, another thing that this bill or this act does is that it's recognizing that right now, um, going back as far back to the Patriot Act, um, we had this thing called, um, uh, uh, oh my gosh, I forget what it's called now, but it, the Patriot Act basically um, said, oh, uh, said that anybody who provided any kind of um, support to, or who were assisted by um, uh, opposing governments or terrorist groups um, were not allowed to come in as refugees to the United States. And in the case of Afghans, um, a lot of individuals have been forced to work, go to school, um, uh, accompany um, uh, Taliban associates, not under, not because they wanted to, but under certain amount of duress. But according to U.S. law, um, the U.S. is able to say that a lot of these vulnerable Afghans will not be able to become SIVs or refugees um, if they've been shown to be any, in any way, shape, or form associated, even under duress. And so this act will state that there has to be more scrutiny and there, there has to be an opportunity for them to be afforded their rights, um, in which case uh, there is an actual um, provision in it that, that allows for um, uh, discretionary waiver authority. So that is the Afghan Adjustment Act, and it's still something that we're fighting for. So I'm going to give information about how you can contact um, Congress and let them know that you'd like to pass the Afghan Adjustment Act. Um, I'm going to move into resettlement really quickly here. Um, so I really want to take you into the world of refugee resettlement right now, because We've been hearing nonstop about the Afghan crisis, and obviously we, we care about the Afghans and we want them to um, receive the resettlement services that they need. But what we're really concerned about here is that the, the refugee resettlement system, the admissions program in the United States is severely, severely crippled right now. It's in a very difficult situation. It's um, been all, almost nearly entirely dismantled over the past four years um, due to the Trump administration. And right now we are finding that the numbers are going to increase by 995%. Um, that is not a joke. It's 995% increase in the projected admissions since last year. Last year, which ended September 30th, 2021, we resettled 11,411 refugee individuals. And in the year ahead, the Biden administration pro projects to resettle 125,000 refugees. That's a huge, huge amount. Um, so we're really concerned about what this is going to do to the system and how we are going to respond. <clears throat> and in order for you to understand how this how this even came to be. I just want to take you through the US refugee admissions programs history really, really quickly. I kind of threw out just a few very important dates that I thought were important just to, to look at in terms of how the numbers have changed and how policies have changed over the years. Um, quickly, you know, you'll see that 1975 is the first time that the US actually um, recognized that we needed to do something more to assist uh, refugees. This is after the fall of Vietnam. We had a, uh, thousands of, hundreds of thousands of Indo-Chinese that were using the Refugee Task Force and temporary funding. Um, from 1975 to 1980, uh, Congress was, and, and, and advocates across the country were advocating for uh, 
uh, Refugee Act, um, which would allow for temporary uh, assistance to refugees, funding, federal funding, and, um, and general services uh, that the task force was already providing. Um, it passed in 1980, and it standardized those refugee services. At the time that that Refugee Act passed, we resettled 207,116 refugee individuals. So back in 1980, the number we resettled was 207,000. Last year, we resettled 11,411 people. The only other time we've, we've seen such diminished numbers was post 9-11. And I, I was around during that period. I remember very clearly what happened. Um, uh, after 9-11, the Bush administration placed a three-month moratorium on refugee arrivals. Um, it left a lot, about 20,000 refugees who were approved to travel li in limbo. But what it also did, this pause, although people say it was temporary, it actually severely impacted the infrastructure of the refugee admissions program and all those resettlement agencies because the funding formula follows the numbers. And so when the numbers diminished, the funding diminished as well. And so all these agencies had to try to figure out ways to plan and operate under an atypical situation. Um, fortunately, uh, things changed, numbers started increasing with the Bush administration. And then between the Bush administration and the Obama administration, the average number of refugees resettled per year was 50,000 to 84,000. The tops was 84,000 during the Syrian refugee crisis in 2016. So we went from, you know, that 20, 27, 22,000 in, in 2002 to the 84,000 in 2016. And then when Trump came into office, almost immediately in January of 2017, he dramatically cut the numbers um, of refugees admitted, admitted and the cap on refugee admissions. Um, at that time, it was cut to 22,560 uh, refugees. So that is how things have gone. As you recall, I said, we are going to be resettling 125,000 refugees and that is not including the SIVs um, who are Afghan evacuees. Um, and I had a conversation a couple of days ago with one of my colleagues at Refugee One, which is one of the local large um, refugee resettlement agencies. And he told me that, um, in the federal fiscal year 2021, which is October through September, right? And it just ended in September 2021, they resettled Refugee One, one of the biggest agencies in Chicago, resettled 50 refugees, 50. And in the past two weeks, they've resettled 50 refugees. They expect to resettle 800 refugees during this federal fiscal year. And they will also be resettling SIVs and any parolees who, be, who become SIVs. So it's a huge, huge, huge shift in numbers. Um, and because of that, we're concerned. The impact of all of the, uh, of the shutdowns with both COVID and the Trump administration's shutdowns and um, you know, near dismantling of the refugee admissions program, we had all, over 134 partner sites, which are the sites across the country that actually do the work on the ground to resettle refugees. 134 of those sites closed down um, or they were zeroed out, which means that they were put on hold. Um, that's a 38% de decrease in overall resettlement capacity. And that is just, that's what we're just coming out of, right? So, you know, Biden hasn't miraculously made everything come back to life. Um, we also experience reductions in staff and funds that go behind, you know, all the services, all the all the work that is done to make sure that families don't just get resettled within the first 30 to 90 days or the first year, but they're actually accompanied while they integrate into American society. Um, there was reduction to such a degree with staff that are seasoned, who are, are skilled, who understand how the system works that many of the agencies, especially the smaller agencies, are really concerned about how they're gonna be able to keep up. And then first, and then finally, there's the interrupted relationships, which are really important because these relationships with schools, with healthcare providers, with police stations, with fire services, 
all of these different providers within our communities, with the faith-based organizations and churches, all those relationships are important, but when you don't have anything to report back, when you don't have information on new arrivals, those relationships became a little bit interrupted, and we're concerned about our ability to rebuild those relationships. And this is all because of the of that first quote I mentioned to you, which is that we have been working with a very professionalized, centralized refugee resettlement program, and we really need to get a little bit back to basics where we're thinking about how the community can keep people um, uh, safe and protected um, and resettle them as well. Um, so these are things that we're hoping that faith-based organizations, churches, congregations can step up and assist with as well. Um, so how can you help? Um, some of the ways, yes. Oh, I'm going to have to uh, exercise my timekeeper's role. Uh, we have right now 14 minutes before the end of the workshop. And so what I would recommend is this, number one for the workshop, uh, uh, to allow the rest of the time for Sister Bernadine to talk about the, south, the crisis on the southern border uh, and uh, the last uh, few seconds for Father Primo to uh, pray us out. And I hope that our presenters do not mind this, but I would like to follow up with any questions. Folks, you can email me your questions outside of the parameters of this, of this workshop and I will make sure to forward them on to our presenters for, for their responses. Okay, is everybody okay with that? Okay, Bashana, you can understand the amount of information and what is going on here and our presenters' efforts to get all that information out to you so that you can turn around and share that with your congregations. So I apologize, Shana. Uh, Sister Bernadine, would you like to take up the, the, the remainder of our time here? There's plenty to talk about. I know, I'm being a woman of few words. Anyway, good evening, everyone, and thank you for hanging in here. Um, Louisa, you're going to help me. Thank you very much. Um, quickly, um, my task is to talk about asylum seekers at the southern border. How are we going to welcome our brothers and sisters? Are we going to say, welcome, come on in, we're glad you're here? Are we going to say, stay home, we don't want you here? We're going to put you in jail. We're going to throw you out as soon as you show up. Um, <clears throat> we heard about um, a little bit about detention and in 2014, the Obama administration declared because of the rush of people coming across the southern border that we had to put all these people in jail because we did not have a robust asylum system. So much money has been spent on detention centers. Um, next slide, please. The um, Narrative uh, on the border needs to change. I live about two miles from the Chicago Evanston border. And if you live on the edge of your city, you know that it's all one. You might go to, to the doctor in the other town, you might go to worship, you visit your friends, you might go shopping. So there's a lot of action. And 11 million people cross the Southern border every month and thousands of people fly into the United States every day. The Mexico-US border extends almost 2,000 miles from the Pacific Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico, from Tijuana, Mexico, to, and San Isidro on the US side, to Matamoros, Tamaulipas, and Mexico to Brownsville, Texas on the east. Six states in Mexico share the border with four states in the United States. There are 48 border crossings where commercial, pedestrian, and vehicular traffic can go back and forth, again, for commerce. And then there are 330 ports of entry where people need to present documents to get in and out. Uh, I have a typo on here, being the world's worst typist. Um, the border wall <laughs> is about 700 miles completed, not 700 feet. And as the border, as the wall has grown in from uh, the west, from Tijuana, uh, and many migrants have been forced to cross in the desert. Thousands of people have died in the desert, as you are probably well aware of. However, aside from the physical wall that the Trump administration was very excited about, the new technology from all of our involvement in wars around the world is the new electronic wall. So that's another concern, but that's a topic for another day. All right, who could seek asylum? We can, um, next slide, please. 
as Shana mentioned, there's a difference between refugees and asylees. Refugees come into the country with documents. Asylees <clears throat> may come in with documents, but they don't come in with refugee documents. Under our laws and under international law, a foreign national has the right to seek asylum. Not that they will get it, but they have the right to ask and they can request it for protection at the time of their arrival or after being physically present in the United States. And the reasons why they can um, apply would be a person who is unwilling or unable to return to his or her country and cannot obtain the protection of the country due to past persecution or a well-founded fear of persecution in the future on account of one's race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or political opinion. What is not a basis for asylum? What's missing here? Economics, right? You can't say because I want a better life for my family, but if you had a, a business in another country and you were being extorted to pay the rent to the cartels, you have to explain how you could not be protected by the local government so you could afford your life. So asylum is very tricky. So quickly, the process present oneself to the border, to the Customs and Border, Patro border Protection Officer or a USCIS officer. And um, <clears throat> you have to have a, a reasonably believable case. Now what's happening because of the volume of people at the border, the CBP officers are making these determinations and they have not been trained in immigration law to any great extent. If you are believed to have a claim, you are assigned an A number, given a date, place, and time of a hearing, so you can continue your process for application. And as Shauna mentioned, it's based on a well-founded fear. We can move right along with that. Um, the process, next slide, please. The uh, Trump administration started the MPP or the Remain Migrant Protection Program or the Remain in Mexico program. This became effective on January 28, 2019 in San Ysidro, California. And this was a memorandum, not a law or regulations that went through Congress or the usual procedure. Asylum seekers were not allowed into the United States to get to a family member or a friend where they could pursue their claim, but they were told to return to Mexico and wait there, which caused great, is causing great problems. Number one, access to counsel. 10 courts were set up in Mexico, which afforded little preparation time and very short time for hearings. People living under tarps had no fixed address, and so many of them did not receive notice of their hearing. You've been reading about the dangerous conditions, the lack of housing, food, medical care, transportation in these places, and the people are subject to extortion, kidnapping, violence, robbery, rape, and murder. Um, this MPP has been before the courts and, and joined and all that, and it was supposed to go back into effect. Biden cut it off, and it was supposed to go back into effect as per court order next week on November 15th, but then on November 1st, there was a memorandum terminating MPP, so who knows what is going to happen. Next slide, please. The other thing that is of horrendous um, consequence are the Title 42 exposure, expulsions. This was due to COVID-19. Since March 20th, 2020, 1.2 million expulsions have occurred. And Title 42 is a health law and section 265 of this health law permits the director of the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, to prohibit the introduction into to the US of individuals when the director believes that there is a serious danger of the introduction of a communicable disease into the United States. Originally, the CDC opposed this, but now they support it. There's no opportunity to contest expulsion unless makes a quick claim for fear of persecution, which a lot of people don't know about. A little over 3,000 people were screened for torture because they knew to ask for, to make a claim because of fear of persecution. 272 out of this 
more than 3,000 people were taken out of Title 42 and permitted to seek asylum. Next slide, please. Um, the effect of Title 42 is an agreement with the Mexican government to return Mexican, Guatemalan, Honduran, and Salvadoran families and single adults. These people are driven to the border and with nothing and told to walk across and figure out their life from there. About a month ago, you probably all saw the um, news coverage of the 7,000 Haitians who attempted to cross the Rio Grande at Ciudad Acuna to enter into Del Rio, Texas, and they were um, chased by the Border Patrol on their horses and many people were harmed and injured and flown back to Haiti in the midst of all of their um, political turmoil and all of the natural disasters that have afflicted our sisters and brothers in Haiti. There are 15,000 people waiting to request Asylum in Mexico, it's called metering. A certain number of people are allowed in. 16,000 unaccompanied children and a child is a person under the age of 18 were expelled under Title 42 in spite of the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act, TVPRA, as we say in the trade. In January of this year, the state of Tamaulipas, which is near Brownsville and McAllen, refused to expel children under the age of seven. Next. Uh, next. Uh, um, I recently spoke to people working in El Paso, Texas. I myself was at Annunciation House a couple of times before the pandemic. This uh, organization has been going on for over 40 years. They have three permanent shelters with the capacity for 500, 150 people. Um, they have um, had many guests from uh, Central America, Cuba, Brazil, Haiti, and Turkey. They shared the story of a Haitian family that had traveled from Haiti to Chile to earn enough money to get to the United States. They came with their new clothes. They were coming to seek asylum. They were stripped of their clothes and all of their belongings, including their passports, given sweatpants, sweatshirts, flip-flops, and allowed to join their family in Florida to pursue their asylum claim. Ciudad Juarez, across the border from El Paso, <clears throat> has 23 shelters sponsored by many churches in the United States and Mexico. The sisters shared a story of a single woman who fled El Salvador. She had witnessed her husband being killed, um, and she was on the street, and a woman said, do you need shelter? I will take you in. So she accepted this woman's hospitality only to be extorted for $1,500 per week. With the help of HIAS, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, they helped her get out of this situation and connect her with Las Americas uh, Legal Services to get her a safe place in the United States. Next, next slide, please. Um, they, in March um, and June, from March to June, Annunciation House had only 25 to 30 guests. We had hundreds a day when we were there. They also care for people who have suffered injuries, who have climbed the wall or have lost limbs or been injured by riding the train. Many of them are indigenous speakers and um, their Spanish may be their second or third language. They also reported that there's a hotel in El Paso called Endeavor and ICE has an $86.9 million contract with them where they put people up for 72 hours to um, hold them before they process them and move them on the way. Again, if we used all of this money we are giving to private prisons, we could have an asylum and an immigration system that could serve people to get the remedies they're entitled to. All right, let's take a quick look at the Catholic Charities of the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, the Humanitarian Respite Center is in McAllen. This is, we're now on the eastern end of the border. I hope you can take 10 minutes to watch the film that I sent out to you and share that with your groups. This was filmed in the migrant camp in Matamoros in October of 2020. And it shows the medical needs of the people, the need access to counsel, safety, food, and shelter. I talked to one of the sisters the other day and they said that 
they had a chance to cross the border to see the camp that's called Plaza de Americas there. And um, they said, it, it's just horrendous. And they were carefully screened and were watched by the uh, radio people who were part of the cartels watching to see who was being visited. And they were told not to have any jewelry or anything that could be, they could be robbed for. Uh, there is a 1,000 bed shelter set up in, uh, in um, it's in McAllen, not in Matamoros, uh, that um, has been horrendous. It's supposed to protect the migrants from vandalism, kidnapping, and extortion. However, this is a place that had the children in cages in 2018 when we all heard about that. Right now, most of the people coming are from Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, with a few in Peru. And ICE is allowing families in with children under the age of six, when pregnant women and moms and dads and single parents with kids. Uh, they're setting up the tent courts again, now that MPP is moving forward, hopefully, and attorneys are trying to move the cases along. Um, Sister Bernadine, I'm going to have to okay. interrupt um, and uh, suggest to folks, if you would like to hear further from our panelists, uh, I would be happy to extend invitations for them to speak at a sanctuary task force meeting and to complete telling us what they had wanted to tell us this evening. So you have my email address uh, in the chat box, and I'm now going to ask uh, Father, uh, Father Primo to pray us out, and I give thanks for all of you to be here and particularly for our uh, panelists who are working diligently on behalf of immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers. Thank you. Father Primo, you're on mute. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Also with you. Lord, we thank you for opening the hearts of many to those who are fleeing for their lives. Help us now to open our arms in welcome and reach out our hands in support that the desperate may find new hope and lives torn apart be restored. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ who fled persecution at his birth and at his last triumph over death. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you. Bye -bye.